Good afternoon and welcome to the Ubiquity PLC Full Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted anytime by the Q&A tab situated in the top right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. Have the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Alan Newman, CFO, and Nick Waters, CEO. Good afternoon to you both. Uh, good afternoon, and um, welcome to our annual results presentation. My name uh, is Nick Waters. Uh, Alan's uh, to my side. Um, we'll share the presentation. I will pass to Alan uh, to talk through the numbers in a moment. But first of all, um, for those of you that are not familiar with us, or may, maybe not so familiar with us, I'll just take a moment to explain who we are and what we do. Um, so we describe ourselves as a world leader in media investment analysis. Um, what does that mean? Um, so advertisers spend very, very large sums of money buying media to communicate their message. And they buy that media through agencies. And they come to us to help them understand whether they're buying that media effectively and efficiently um, in comparison to other players in the market space. So our role is to help them drive efficiency, effectiveness, uh, eliminate waste and create value from their very large media investments. Um, it's, a, it's a huge market, totally. Global advertising spend is around about 750 billion US dollars. Um, but if you look at our primary target customer, which is the world's 100 largest advertisers, they themselves spend uh, in excess of 100 billion dollars a year. So we have an opportunity to create significant value for them. We offer our services um, through five service lines. You can see on the bottom left um, corner of the screen there, media management, media performance, marketing effectiveness, technology advisory, and contract compliance. Um, and we are a, a, a neutral party, which enables us to offer impartial objective advice. And by that, I mean our only source of revenue is from the brand owner. We don't take any revenue from any other part of the media or advertising supply chain. We have over 450 specialists operating from 24, 21 sorry, offices around the world. And those offices cover um, over 75% of the global advertising market. So we have a, a very, very comprehensive and independent view of the market. We analyze around about $55 billion of media spend um, in over 75 markets uh, a year and we analyze trillions of, uh, of digital media impressions. The contract compliance division, it's called Firm Decisions, and that audits uh, around about $40 billion of contract value annually. And uh, over 70 of the world's top 100 advertisers um, are clients of ours. So that's an introduction um, to who we are. Um, a quick summary of our performance in 2021 um, it was a strong recovery versus 2020. Clearly, 2020 was a difficult year. Our business was um, notably impacted by the COVID pandemic. So we've seen a good recovery from that in 21. Uh, both revenue and profitability were slightly ahead of management expectations. So a good performance that we're satisfied with. That was supported by both um, healthy new business wins, uh, but also good growth, solid growth from existing clients uh, and we managed our cost base in a, a prudent manner. Our digital revenue is ahead of plan and the contribution, the profit contribution that makes is also ahead of plan. So the digital element of the strategy is performing well. And the recovery was uh, very broad based across the business. Um, all business units in all regions grew um, uh, in terms of a, a, a very good strong recovery uh, everywhere. Uh, Asia Pacific grew the fastest, followed by North America. <clears throat> so we ended the year in a very strong financial position. And uh, just yesterday, we announced two acquisitions which will accelerate our growth uh, and the operating efficiencies in the business and our strategic journey. I'll pass to Alan now for the financial aid. Thanks, Nick. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, our results uh, for the year which we announced um, on Wednesday were uh, about very similar to uh, the trading update we gave in February. So we were not a surprise at that point. Our revenue in 2021 was 13% up on, on the prior year. 
um, at 63 million. And that reflected a, a, a good business momentum across all our regions. So um, continental Europe, Asia Pacific, America, and um, the UK, with Asia Pacific doing particularly well, growing by 23%, um, and America doing very well as well. And then quite a strong profit growth in the UK, which is our largest market, it's more mature, but where we'd really been uh, addressing the cost base. And all of those factors, particularly you know, the overall revenue driver, led us to come back into profit and generate uh, underlying operating profit of 4.7 million pounds, which is a margin of 7.5%. Um, that was better than originally um, expected this time last year when the initial analyst view was we get 3.5 million, we upgraded at the half year and we're pleased to essentially have upgraded again at the final year, uh, year end. We are basically a cash generative business, so we normally convert about 100% of our profits into tax, uh, into, ta into cash, sorry, there or thereabouts. Um, but uh, this year we had a particularly strong cash inflow, partly really a phasing of working capital with uh, strong debtor collections in, in, towards the year end and some of our payables um, not being required to be paid till January. The, that led to our net debt being um, 4.8 million, which again was better than the analysts had expected, um, and significantly better than last year, three million pound improvement. Um, and uh, that again shows the strength, the improving strength of our balance sheet. In terms of operational uh, highlights, what drove the revenue growth and profit performance, we had um, a number of new mandates, some of which have been um, identified last year when Accenture left the market and we'd won a number of new clients, including Daimler on this list here. And we had existing clients such as Unilever and Ferrero who gave us more work this year than they had the previous year. Um, within that revenue, we also have a significant um, increase in revenue, about um, 2.7 million pounds increase to 3.7 from our digital media solutions. These are the a range of solutions specifically focusing on reporting the performance uh, or our advertised performance in their spend on digital media. And we bought a company called Digital Decisions in 2020. And this has an automated uh, service, uh, what's called data monitoring service, which we have um, begun to roll out to a number of our clients and with great success. It's also brought with it a number of other solutions which are, have been rolled out this year and indeed last year as well to provide an, a, a real range of services targeting uh, allowing our advertisers to understand their uh, digital media performance. Another highlight was that this year was a year in which there were a number, uh, a large number of agency selections after 2020 when some advertisers postponed these and we managed uh, six of the top 10 largest global and multinational selection processes. And that's on the public record. It's, it's, it's identified in the trade media, uh, which in itself is helpful to our profile, but it's also helpful in securing follow on work. Because if we run an agency selection process and help define the agency goals, then uh, we often will get the tracking work that follows from that to see whether or not the agency is delivering. Looking into this year, we started well the first quarter. We're very much um, in line with our expectations of the first quarter with new revenue growth coming through um, and a healthy pipeline uh, and continued momentum looking ahead. We haven't, we were often asked the question about um, the impact of initially economic changes, you know, recession potentially, and certainly inflation. And we're seeing some cost inflation amongst you know, in staff, although we're containing that at the moment well. We are managing to get some of our clients to uh, increase their, um, you know, increase our prices to them rather, to agree that. And, um, uh, but the more recent developments in Ukraine have cast a, a shadow, shall we say, on our operation in Russia, which in um, last year accounted for a million pounds of revenue and 300,000 of profit. That's all. Um, business done inside Russia for Russian based clients. But given the developments in the Ukraine, we are as a board keeping that operation very much under review uh, in determining its future. But we are positive about the outlook for FY22 this year, <coughs> excuse me, and we do see definitely opportunities for continued growth and margin enhancement, and which put us into good stead for <coughs> considering the acquisitions that, that we announced uh, this week.
Just quickly highlighting a few um, points in the balance sheet. Excuse me, I just a quick glass of water. Um, you'll see that um, I, we've highlighted here as a separate item, um, rather strange accounting, which is that we have to treat the con deferred consideration on digital decisions, which um, is due next year, as a PL item because it's related to the uh, uh, staying in, in the business of the founder and vendor, chief vendor, and therefore it's a PL charge rather than just going to the balance sheet. Nonetheless, we've estimated that we expect to pay about £12.5 million pounds in that uh, deferred consideration next year, and we've accrued £7.9 million of that in, in, the, in the year, uh, in 2021. Um, and uh, sorry, I also discussed net debt. Uh, that comprises gross cash of 13 million and an 18 million pound bank loan as at the end of uh, drawn down as at the end of last year. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a strong cash flow. Total cash flow from operations was 11.8 million, of which 13.2 is, is, is what we call underlying, uh, excludes exceptional items and highlighted items. And we um, spent a uh, little bit of money. Well, um, Finishing off the Italy minority buyout, 1.2 million, um, a little bit for Ireland, and, and we actually had slightly lower internally generated R&D this year, 900,000 compared to 1.1, which all added up to 3 million investing activities, 3.3 million financing activities, which includes reducing our loan and uh, the IFR 16 lease liability payments coming down, uh, sorry, being spent at 2.1. Uh, and they are coming down as, as the leases get towards expiry. So the net effect was an increasing banking cash of 2 million, um, getting us to that 13 million uh, balance at the end of the year. Um, as in preparation for the acquisitions that we announced this week, we uh, have renegotiated and extended and in fact increased our bank facilities, our RCF, uh, which is provided by Barclays and NatWest, we've increased it to 30 million pounds from the 24 million level it was at before, under very similar covenants to those we had before, uh, but with a repayment um, starting uh, next year of one and a quarter million a year of the uh, uh, overall loan facility. So the banks are saying, you know, you've got to generate cash. Uh, we they expect us to pay some of it back, and clearly, um, if we then take on the uh, placing results that uh, was announced today, uh, sorry, yesterday at 15 million pounds, that puts our balance sheet uh, into very, very uh, strong and much, much stronger position than we had before. Within the business, we, we report media, which is the bulk of our business and analytics and tech. Um, the media business grew most strongly, particularly supported by the digital media solutions uh, element. Uh, as I said, contributed to just under half of that growth. Uh, in terms of profit, the media remains our, our higher margin area. It's more mature, and we got the margin back uh, up from 15 last year to 19, which is, and we want to see that going further. Uh, as important is as a turnaround, analytics and tech, which had been loss making last year, have come back into profit um, at a 14% margin which is actually better than we'd achieved um, two years ago prior to COVID. Um, and we have a small increase in our central costs, mainly because of re-establishing a bonus provision, uh, all of which contributed uh, to the margin I mentioned before, 7.5% of the total profit of 4.7 million. Nick. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, I will um, take you through a progress update against the strategy um, but to start off with, just a quick overview of the market in which we operate, which we uh, believe provides us with strong growth opportunities. And indeed, the global advertising markets um, are strong at the moment. They rebounded uh, very, very strongly from the COVID pandemic. So we're, we're buoyant through 21, and we see that continuing at the moment into 2022. Um, as you'll be well aware, digital channels dominate um, advertising these days. 64% uh, of all advertising spent globally will go through digital channels um, and uh, uh, the, the, the dominant tech platforms will make up uh, approximately 50% of all that spend. <clears throat> there are, however, new channel dynamics um, which are um, increasing in scale uh, and uh, continuing to increase 
complexity in the advertising market. So last year we saw very, very strong growth in the e-retail platforms. Uh, everybody, of course, is very familiar with Amazon, but uh, in the United States, the, the big retailers like Walmart and Kroger and Home Depot and Instacart have all started um, selling inventory, media inventory on their websites now. Um, and that is turning into a multi-billion dollar uh, advertising revenue stream for them. Um, similarly, advanced TV or connected TV is reaching a critical mass in the US. We're um, all familiar with the subscription funded uh, streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime, but there's a, a, a range of advertiser funded advanced TV solutions now in the US. Um, and we're starting to see that roll into other markets here. ITV just recently launched ITVX um, on a similar basis. <clears throat> um, approximately 15% of all television spend in the US is now through advanced television. So that is, as I said, increasing the complexity in the market, which is supportive for our business. There were considerable inflationary pressures seen in broadcast media um, towards the end of last year, I think from September onwards, um, the majority of my conversations with clients was about um, helping them mitigate the uh, television inflation that was coming through. But also we've seen a very strong inflation in premium digital inventory. Now that's probably quite a good thing as advertisers have, are starting to move away from the long tail of, of cheap impressions they're buying and focusing their spend with premium publishers. Um, but it is sort of pushing up the cost of their advertising. Other major topic uh, that's been in the news, in, in, in all the news, not just our industry news, uh, is that around uh, data protection and consumer consent. Um, and just recently, in the last month or so, both the Belgian and Dutch data protection authorities have ruled that the IAB's transparency and consent framework actually breaches GDPR. And of course, that is the framework um, through which the European advertising industry, online industry, has worked. So that throws throws up a lot of questions about how, to, uh, how, how online advertising is going to work and be targeted in the near future. Uh, 2021 was also a, a, specific, um, a specific feature, if you like, in the industry, and that's the amount of um, media business that was put up to tender by advertisers. Um, they typically, uh, a typical contract with a media agency might last for three years, and then they'll put their business up for tender um, uh, to be competed for. Um, because of the challenges of 2020, when many, many companies, most companies, had um, higher priorities on their mind, um, they didn't put the business out to tender. So there was some pent-up demand in 21, which was very supportive for our, our business last year. So that's the, the context of the market in which we operate. Um, a recap on the strategy that we set out at the end of 2020 um, to start executing from the start of 2021. We set out four points to the strategy. Um, firstly, was to increase revenue from new productized uh, digital services uh, or solutions to the digital market that we were um, developing and uh, aiming to bring to market uh, through 2021. Secondly, to build out higher value strategic relationships with major customers. Um, thirdly, to improve the operating efficiency of the business, as you, you saw from Alan's uh, presentation, our operating margin is 7.5%, so we need a plan um, to push that up into double figures and then into the mid-teens. And then fourthly, to strengthen the business in North America and Asia Pacific. The origins of the business are here in the UK, so we have a, a, a large and mature business, um, but the business is also mature in continental Europe, where our segment is, uh, has been well understood and, and well bought for many years. Our segment is, is less mature in North America, and Asia Pacific, and as a consequence, uh, our business is not so scaled in those markets, but we see very good opportunity for growth. So they're the four elements of the strategy, and I'll walk through how we're doing uh, against each of them. So our digital product solutions are performing ahead of expectation. We, we can um, take some satisfaction from this area of the business. We brought to market seven data-led product solutions, um, which, will, uh, uh, which enable us to analyze the digital markets um, and uh, help our clients uh, recognize where their spend is being inefficient and help them to increase value out of those investments. So revenue growth from, from those solutions was 260%, um, albeit off a, a low base in 2020, 
um, which is when we really started to uh, to innovate. Um, but delivered three point seven million pounds, a little over five percent of total group revenues, um, and at a very healthy margin of fifty one percent. And we see us uh, being able to maintain that margin for these services uh, and probably keep it stabilised at around about fifty five percent. So we'll continue to uh, push um, aggressively with these productized data led solutions. Our operational KPIs that we set ourselves for this are, are ahead of plan. So at the end of 2020, we had 10 clients buying these services and operating on our media data platform. At the end of 21, we had 28 clients. Um, we now have over $3 billion of uh, digital media investment analyzed through the platform, up from half a billion a year earlier. And we've now uh, have 600, almost 650 billion impressions that we are um, analyzing or have analyzed coming from 87 markets. So we're getting a, a real great uh, uh, breadth and depth of data, which allows us or enables us to provide more and more uh, valuable advice to our clients. Um, these services are proving uh, very strong for clients. They're able to realize the tangible value from these services very quickly in year. So that's um, providing us with great case studies that we can go to other clients with um, and help uh, market these services to them. Uh, one of the services we brought to market was one called uh, Responsible Media Investment. Um, and we piloted it because we weren't uh, clear what we were going to find. Uh, we piloted it with a number of our higher, uh, higher value clients in the US and UK. And essentially what we do there is we uh, uh, take uh, the data relating to our clients' digital media spend and match it with third-party data um, related to uh, uh, certain behaviors or characteristics of publishers or tech platforms. Um, so uh, we identify publishers that perhaps um, uh, are promoting hate speech or um, uh, disinformation like anti-vax, uh, uh, content and material like that, or those uh, that are known um, to, uh, to rip off intellectual property and those that perhaps have weak consumer consent control. So we match, uh, match the data sets and identify where clients' investments or advertising spend are going to support uh, bad actors in the supply chain. And on the basis of the, the findings from those pilots, we are rolling that out um, further this year as, as um, some of the clients have been quite alarmed to see um, uh, where their investments are going. We have several more products under development in the second half, to release in the second half of this year. Turning to the second part of the strategy, clients, um, we, we have made strong progress in developing higher value strategic clients. Uh, we defined a universe of 21 higher value strategic clients that we wanted to build more uh, relationships with and build uh, greater commercial relationships with. And the revenue growth from that universe was very strong, considerably ahead of uh, total revenue growth for the, the group. That's enabled us to invest in more uh, what we call global client partners. They're the people that have the experience and the knowledge, uh, the seniority and the gravitas to build these relationships with very large multinational advertisers. So we're investing into that capability and broadening the geographic reach where, where big advertisers are headquartered uh, in Amsterdam, in Paris, um, in Germany, in the United States. Um, we also set ourselves um, uh, operational KPIs in terms of how many clients are buying two or more service lines and um, we performed very well against that. At the end of 2020, we had 58 clients buying two or more service lines and during the course of the, uh, the 12 months at the end of 21, we moved that up to 76. Um, Alan referenced the fact that we uh, performed very well in gaining um, uh, major mandates or, or agency selection mandates from major um, international Advertisers, in fact, we manage six of the top 10 largest global multinational agency processes, including three of the top five. So we're highly competitive in that segment. We're highly recognized um, as uh, very professional and doing a great job there. Um, and we've been uh, very effective at cross-selling into the new digital product solutions. The third uh, element of the strategy is improving our operational efficiency. Um, and we can see uh, progress there and continued uh, improvement. Uh, the Media Operations Centre, which is effectively a scaled delivery centre, we operate in uh, in Madrid, it's the near shore centre, um, that supported 15% more projects in the prior 
years, so we're moving, moving work into the scale centre um, really at the pace that we want to. Um, there is now a, a Guatemala extension to the Media Operations Centre, which enables us to better service work from the US time zone. We have improved our process automation in two parts of the business. First of all, in the media performance part in the US, uh, and secondly, piloting RPA solutions in firm decisions. Um, also to support firm decisions, our contract compliance division, we are developing a shared service center in India, which will further enable us to improve cost efficiencies. <clears throat> uh, and we continue to evaluate how we uh, streamline uh, our operating model uh, and how we can develop harmonized and standardized ways of working to enable further automation. And this is really where um, uh, one of the acquisitions that we announced yesterday comes in. The primary strategic rationale for acquiring the media park business was its high quality technology platform, um, which will enable us to, to service our clients um, more efficiently. Um, and the final of the four elements of uh, the strategy, strengthening in North America and Asia Pacific. Again, very good progress here. I'm very pleased to report strong progress. Uh, we recruited new managing directors uh, at the start of the year into both the US and the China business. Um, and that's led to very good new business performance in both of them. Um, I'm not able to name the, uh, the wins in the US, the clients concerned prefer not to have their names uh, publicized, um, but uh, a very major packaged goods uh, brand company is now, which was secured in 2021, is now one of our largest, three largest clients. Um, a very significant, well-known West Coast global technology leader um, is buying our digital product solutions office and a, a leading global alcohol brand has also awarded us their business in the US. In China, the, the client community is uh, less shy, shall we say, about allowing us to use their names in these presentations. Huawei, you'll all be very familiar with, um, has had to retreat from Western markets really owing to uh, geopolitical situations, but is a huge advertiser in its domestic market. So um, them awarding us their business in China is a very, very strong endorsement. Uh, and that uh, led to us picking up Meng Yu, a state-owned dairy company, and Kang Shifu, which is a, a massive uh, noodle uh, uh, business uh, across the whole of China. But it wasn't just Chinese domestic businesses, LVMH, and, uh, uh, and of course, China is a huge market for uh, the world's luxury good brands. So LVMH is a big, big client in China and one of the uh, most famous sports apparel brands uh, globally has also awarded us their business there. Um, we organically launched into the India market with Ubiquiti this year. The firm decisions business has been present in India for uh, three years, but um, we, we evaluated the opportunity to bring Ubiquiti to market there. Um, and I'm pleased to report a very good successful start to operations there. We already now uh, count five of India's top 10 largest advertisers as our customers in the market. We extended our geographic reach with uh, a small acquisition in Canada. Ford and Sample was a business that we had used as an outsource partner when our clients required service in the Canadian market. Um, so that business is now rebranded as Ubiquity Canada and enables us to serve those clients directly and capture the revenue directly rather than outsourcing. As Alan mentioned, we do have a small subsidiary in Russia, and clearly, given the terrible situation in Ukraine, um, we keep that uh, the ongoing uh, operations of that business under review. Um, to, to supplement, uh, or really to accelerate the strategic execution of strengthening North America, we acquired and announced this yesterday uh, the acquisition of Media Management Inc. Um, which significantly scales our business in the vital US market. So reporting against our operational metrics, you can see the baseline there is 31st of December 2020 and the progress we've made against that by the end of 2021. So um, just some of these figures are, I'll repeat, number of clients buying two plus service lines has moved from 58 to 76 and the number of clients buying one or more products from the new digital solutions portfolio has gone from uh, 10 to 28. Um, and the volume of digital advertising uh, on, analyzed on the platform, uh, nearly 650 billion impressions up from just over 100, and the value moving from half a billion to over 3 billion. Uh, so we're getting a real breadth and depth um, of data on the platform now. 
And uh, we, we are uh, able to analyze data on the platform from 87 markets up from 50. Um, we are uh, tasking ourselves to derive more of the revenue, more of our media revenue from digital services. Uh, as at the end of December 2020, 25% of our revenue came from digital services. That has moved up, ticked up to 29%. Um, so as the whole business grew by 13%, um, so clearly revenue from digital services grew faster, but obviously we want to get that, uh, that figure up um, further than uh, the 30% mark and gradually move it up towards uh, representing half of our business. Just quickly, uh, a look at the uh, acquisitions. The first one here is Media Path. Um, it's referenced as a Swedish-based multinational media consultancy. Um, and we say it's Swedish-based simply because the founder, uh, Suzanne Elias, is Swedish and lives in Stockholm. But the business was designed to service international clients right from the start. It specializes in three of our specialist areas, um, <clears throat> agency selection processes, performance measurement, and media benchmarking. Um, and it delivers those services through a proprietary technology platform called GMP365. Um, by moving our business over time onto that platform, uh, we believe it will significantly improve the efficiencies by which we operate. Um, it's a 45 team uh, member business, geographically distributed across 12 countries, both in, in markets where they can serve um, large multinational advertisers and also in lower cost markets when um, the analysis can be done uh, in markets like Bulgaria, Indonesia, and India. Mm -hmm. Suzanne will join my leadership team and have the responsibility alongside myself for integrating the business. She has a very, very nice um, uh, roster of blue chip clients, including the, some of the brand names you can see there. AB InBev is, is a huge advertiser, McDonald's obviously very well known, uh, Disney in the United States, and Heineken is a shared client for us. So the primary strategic rationale for acquiring Media Park is um, the uh, technology enablement that it brings with GMP365. On a standalone basis, you can see it's a nice healthy business, 6.3 million pounds of revenue uh, at an operating margin of 29%. And that margin has been stable for the last five years between 27 and 32%. Um, the, the, the deal is a 15.5 million pounds consideration will pay on completion with 75% of the consideration paid in cash and 25% in equity shares. And those shares are subject to a 24-month lock-in period and a further 12-month orderly market agreement. So it very much aligns um, the interests of the Media Path um, shareholders, uh, of which Suzanne was the largest and some of our other key executives are, very much aligns uh, them with our interests in ensuring the success of the deal. Um, turning uh, briefly to Media Management Inc, MMI, um, it is a US focused media audit specialist. In fact, it's a US dedicated one. Uh, it doesn't service clients outside the United States. Um, it has a different approach to media audit from ourselves and also has proprietary technology called Circle Audit, which ingests vast amounts of data directly from the uh, media buying management platforms, platforms like uh, Media Ocean, Hub, Hudson MX, and, uh, and Strata, um, and enables it to forensically analyze. Uh, the media buys on a spot by spot, dollar by dollar basis, um, and provide clients with that um, uh, unique visibility um, and ensure that the campaigns are delivered uh, with accuracy uh, and where they're not delivered with accuracy, and where there is financial discrepancy, clearly that gets uh, highlighted and value returned back to clients. Uh, Thomas Bridge was the founder uh, and um, sole shareholder of that business, uh, and the company has a 40 person team. Centered in St. Louis, that where well, that's where it was uh, originated, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, there's about 20 people there now, and the other 20 people are distributed across the US. Like Suzanne, uh, Thomas will stay in business uh, and he joins the North American management team. And again, the business has a fantastic uh, high quality client roster, including major American corporates like ATT, uh, Geico, and General Motors. So the strategic uh, rationale, the primary strategic rationale for acquiring MMI is the scaling of our business in the United States. In fact, it doubles the size of our business in the United States, so we'll have more than 10 million pounds in revenue next year. Um, the uh, initial consideration is 6.1 million pounds for this and that split. Um, it was, it was a, essentially an 80-20 cash share split Got, uh, got tweaked for our um, tax optimization purposes for the principle to be 
16, and that uh, uh, share component is subject to an 18 month lock in period again with a further 12 month orderly market agreement. There is with this deal uh, a second tranche, a deferred consideration, which will be payable in 2025 based on one times 2024 reported operating profit of the combined ubiquity US and MMI North American businesses, which we expect to be at least three million pounds. Um, both Thomas and our North American management team feel it will be in excess of that, um, but, but we feel uh, um, uh, targeting a minimum of three million pounds is sensible. And that second tranche will also be payable 80% in cash, 20% in ubiquity shares and subject to the same lock-in period. So again, deal structure, uh, designed very much to align the interests of the principal with our interests, enabling us to bring uh, both businesses, media park and MMI, together smoothly, integrate the businesses early to realise synergies early, um, and to align uh, the, the interests of Thomas and Suzanne with those of ourselves to make these deals a success and, and uh, drive our share price up. Um, so if we look at, ahead, the outlook uh, is good. Trading uh, has started the year in line with uh, board's, the board's expectations, and we have good forward visibility still also in line with the board's expectations. Um, clearly, the, there is a caveat to that, which is a caveat that I would think most businesses have, is that um, the geopolitical environment could, uh, could destabilise things, but it has, at this moment, not yet impacted our clients' activity. Um, and uh, or indeed their relationships with us. So um, yes, there's the caveat there, but it's not to materialize at this stage. The two acquisitions that we've talked through will accelerate the company's progress in executing our strategy by increasing our scale in the US um, and uh, facilitating our ability to improve the operating efficiency of the business and gain us access to more of the world's largest advertisers, which are our primary target customer. Uh, and the visibility for the full year is currently in line with our expectations. So to summarise, a good recovery in 2021, and that recovery was broad based across all regions and business units, um, with the revenue uh, and profit contribution from our new portfolio of digital media solutions performing ahead of plan, as was the development of our higher value strategic client relationships. The acquisitions that we've talked through will accelerate our transformation strategy um, and we believe the continued and increasing complexity in the media markets which uh, um, ensure uh, brand advertisers require help navigating them, we feel that is supportive um, to a degree's purpose and our ongoing business. So um, thank you very much for listening. Um, at this point I'll pass back to uh, Alessandra. Nick, Alan, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the top right hand corner, corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Nick, Alan, as you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation and thank you to all the investors for submitting those. Could I just ask you to read out the questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Certainly. Uh, the first question is from Neil B. Do you see any opportunities to provide data analytics for the programmatic trading tech platforms such as trade desk? Sorry, the question's just moved down, <laughs> moved down the screen. Um, I, the answer to that, Neil, is, is no. Our only source of revenue is from the brand owners. Um, and it's very important we keep it that way because one of our, our largest or strongest selling points and assets is our independence. So uh, everybody is trying to sell brand owners something. Their tech solution is better than another. Um, and, uh, and we were able to provide their independent advice as to which tech solution is better than another. Um, so the answer to that is no. Um, Dion S asks, what is Ubiquity's operating margin in the same areas that Media Park Network has one of 29.1%? Well, um, uh, I, I'm actually going to pass to Alan for that in case I... Well, as, as I explained in segmental uh, analysis, broadly speaking, our media um, uh, business, you know, uh, it, 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 which includes the two main services that uh, MediaPath offers, which are um, cost guarantee tracking and agency selection. 
uh, ours overall overall margin there is 19 percent compared to their 29 percent how you can sort of cut and dice that clearly our overall group margin is is seven percent and a half but i think it's fair to say we're at least 10 points um, lower margin in the equivalent businesses than they are as a whole um, Neil B asks, what quantum of cost savings are you targeting following the acquisitions and what operating profit margin are you targeting for 22? Could you achieve 10%? Um, the second question, could we achieve 10%? Yes, uh, we believe so. On a pro forma basis, um, the business would be at 9.7% um, margin, so we definitely in believe 21. Uh, in, in 21, that was on a pro forma basis, so yes, we definitely believe we can achieve 10% in 22. Um, what quantum of cost savings are we targeting? So by 25, um, we believe we will achieve five million pounds of annualised recurring uh, cost savings from the combined acquisition. Um, right, I think we've answered that one. Um, so Neil B again, what is the pro forma net debt position following the acquisitions in place? Um, there's a slightly different one to tell actually because the we only just got the placing information this week, but basically um, we should actually be in net debt position, which is actually similar to where we ended up, so minus five million. So paying out um, uh, 23, uh, sorry, we'll be in net debt position slightly worse because of the way before. We're paying out 23 million, we're raising you know 15, uh, but we're using some of our own resources, so that so the net movement will be roughly. Uh, eight million pounds um, to the, to the uh, worse than we were. So the net debt will be roughly 12 immediately after the acquisition, but clearly we're going to generate cash during the year. We'll have profits coming in from the new businesses. So we've said that by the end of the year, um, we expect to be back into uh, net debt of around uh, one time EBITDA, uh, which will um, you know, be a lot, uh, which is consistent perhaps, like, with where we are now. Sorry, one time operating profit, big pardon, which is where we ended up the year uh, last year. Um, there's a question there about capital markets data. That's from uh, Dion S. We've been promised uh, since over four years ago, capital markets day. One was scheduled in 2019 and then cancelled. Um, uh, I asked because the company has changed a lot and it's difficult to understand from the outside. Yeah, we did actually hold a capital markets day shortly after I joined the business. I joined in July 2020 and we held one, I think it was in September, October 2020. We did. Um, uh, so uh, I think it's fair um, to say we, we, we could do another one soon. We don't have a, a, a date scheduled for one, but it's certainly something we will we will look at doing because, as you said, we have changed um, quite a lot even since uh, September, October 20. Um, Mark H asks, the RNS mentioned potential synergies of £5 million pounds from the Swedish acquisition. Well, it was actually from the two acquisitions combined. Uh, can you provide more colour on the nature of the synergies, hard or soft, cost or revenue, etc.? Yeah, the synergy target we set of £5 million is all cost synergies. Um, and it's sort of three areas. One is um, uh, within America, um, there are some imme pretty immediate synergies on sort of external cost data, for example, contracts that we have with people like Nielsen, where we expect to save by simply only having one contract instead of two. Um, and then secondly, there are um, savings from the bringing together, again in America, of our two businesses, where we have some extent duplication of, of roles and people in roles. So, so over time, we'll, we'll be able to eliminate some of those duplications and therefore probably means reducing the uh, the combined headcount a little bit, uh, and or avoiding having to recruit people for to support growth, which is the position we were going to be in this year in America before the acquisition. The other and larger proportion of the five million, uh, which will occur over time, is uh, then bringing us onto the uh, adopting the Media Path platform and getting synergies, um, uh, whereby we simply will be reducing the delivery cost, therefore the labour time, particularly. Um, that it takes to to carry out our work. That's you know the system that the media path brings is is uh, more you know will provide uh, greater efficiency for us. So it's again going to be ultimately headcount reduction um, in uh, in the current ubiquity group, not so much in the media path side. 
another question from Mark H. Do you now have the business structure in place to achieve your medium-term objectives or will further high-level hires be necessary? Um, essentially, we've got it in place, I think, and there are no plans to make any further high-level high hires. Um, the two acquisitions uh, actually bring um, some good senior bench strength with them. So no, there's no, there's no plan to add more uh, uh, expensive hires to the business. Um, D on S asks, will you be providing a pro forma starting say from January 21 that includes the recent acquisitions? If so, when? Why not in the 2021 RMS? I think if you read the circular, Dion, you'll see we have provided exactly that as a pro forma statement of what our revenue and profits would have been in January 21 if you add all the acquisitions together. Um, and that would tell you that we had the combined entity would have had 75 million, 74.8 million revenue um, and uh, from 10.7 million uh, profit. So we have provided that pro forma in, in I think, certainly in the circular that um, was just published, to, will be, you'll be receiving. I think it's actually online now and which, uh, and the RNS, I think also included that number. Um... Yeah, what is uh, ah here we uh, sorry the the questions are jumping around a bit. Let me last do I do lots of questions. Last dividend. Last dividend in 2018, Edison in the Hayful research suggested in February 22 there could be a dividend of 0.5p for 21 and then 1.3p for this year. Why no dividend mentioned? What is the dividend policy? Um, I, I don't do recall <laughs> if, if they did put something in 22, then I missed it um, because we suspended the dividend in 2020 um, when the COVID crisis hit, reserve cash, and we were um, definitely not alone in so doing. We, many, many companies did that. Our sense was uh, then that you know we were going through a period where we had a loss. We also uh, wanted to make sure we therefore was, we had to preserve cash, and then we also wanted to make sure we were investing our cash in the business and taking soundings amongst, you know, a, a lot of us, we tend obviously to talk more directly to our institutional shareholders. The general view was there wasn't a strong view that we should be paying a dividend. It was more a sense that as a growth company, we should be investing and keeping the cash in the business. Uh, and that doesn't apply to everyone, but some people felt that. So that's our current view is we don't have a plan to reinstate re the dividend at the moment. Um, some questions from Neil B. Where else are you looking to make fill-in acquisitions? Um, at the moment, geographically, uh, I don't think there are any priorities. Um, you could argue that uh, we don't have businesses that we own in Japan, Korea and Brazil, all of which are very large advertising markets, but they all have their own uh, challenges for a business like ourselves uh, entering. So I, I think we would have to enter carefully, and at the moment, they're, they're not on the priority list. Um, another one from Neil, what were the dampening factors on the slower growth in the UK and Ireland, and are there any signs of improvement in spending, travel, tourism, and autos? Um, well, here in the UK and Ireland, we have, we have a very mature business. Um, we have a large market share. It's impossible to tell exactly what the market share is, because there's no independently published figures. But we have a very large client base, so it is difficult to win new new clients. Um, therefore, to grow the business, we have to bring more solutions to them, uh, more products and more services. Um, and uh, it was really only during the course of 21 that we were bringing the new digital product solutions to market. And we deliberately targeted the first range of solutions at international clients. Um, to, to give visibility to people with regional or, or global job descriptions for the first time across a multi-market basis. It was only really in the back half, maybe even Q, Q4, that we started bringing to market national solutions, which then enable uh, countries like our UK business to sell new services into, into the client. So um, that can explain slow growth. However, we did reorganise the business. I wouldn't, wouldn't call it a restructuring because that, that would overstate it, but we did reorganise the business to uh, significantly enhance the profit contribution coming from the UK. Uh, I should also clarify that when we talked, when I talked about the UK, we talked about services delivered to UK clients covering UK um, media. We have a roster of uh, large clients um, such as Jaguar Land Rover 
which is a UK based business for whom actually, you know, uh, you know they're, they're, we do a lot. And, and, and I was excluding the, the British based clients for whom the outbound, the international work we're doing for them has grown. But I was making the point about the UK domestic market, uh, as Nick has explained, that it has particular factors. Uh, Mark H asks, how long have you been courting these acquisitions and what brought them to a head simultaneously? Can you talk to the process? Who runs the acquisition program? Um, well, both of these acquisitions came out of um, really um, speculative, shall we say, uh, uh, contacts from myself um, in the summer of last year, uh, the, the, the northern, sun, northern hemisphere summer of last year, um, I felt um, we were, say, let's say, six months plus into um, executing against the strategy that we had laid out. I felt we were um, making progress against that, and now was the time to look at inorganic activity. And so I just simply did, a, did an outreach to independent business owners operating in our sector. Um, and through that, developed um, a good dialogue with both Thomas and Suzanne. Um, it became clear that we had uh, common values. And that as we discussed uh, the industry and the business further, we, we saw that we could, we could um, really share a vision of what our combined business um, could look like. Uh, there was no, um, we didn't set out to bring two, uh, two acquisitions to fruition at the same time. It's simply that the, the conversations progressed um, at about the same pace in a similarly positive manner. Um, and so that was it. Uh, neither of these companies, I think it's worth saying, were, were in a process, neither Suzanne nor Thomas had brought their business to market. Um, so there was no auction process, um, and they've both been uh, approached in, in the past by a private equity firm and firms and other trade buyers, but had um, not progressed those discussions. But it was really primarily about cultural alignment. They felt that um, uh, they themselves have very strong cultural alignment to, to our leadership here. Um, and that we uh, shared a common vision of what we could do together. Um, so it was, it was a very collaborative and constructive uh, process. Uh, you ask who runs the acquisition program here? Well, it's myself and Alan, really. We do um, have a senior leadership team or an executive leadership team, uh, all of whom are uh, tasked with um, identifying potential um, acquisition targets and bring them to, to my attention and Alan's attention. Um, and then and then we take it from there. I think there was a question that seems to have disappeared about pro forma media segmental analysis. Okay. Um, someone asked, I think, that w whether or not the, um, well, anyway, the short answer to which is all of the revenue and indeed profit uh, of uh, Media Path and MMI will uh, would fall under media in our segmental analysis. So uh, it would add a it won't go in there. I think I misspoke earlier on. I said the pro forma uh, revenue of the combined business in 2020 was 74.8 million. The pro forma operating profit was actually would have been 7 million and 7.3, which would have given us a margin of 9.7. I think I mixed the margin and the, and the figure up, just to be clear. But that, that will be in the circular that information. Shall I pick up the preemption one as well? Yeah. This question are yeah. there going to be uh, 120 million shares post placing and acquisitions, and what has happened to the preemption rights? Uh, yes, roughly. There's 23 million, I think, is the number of shares being placed, and I think slightly under 120 million. I think it ends up 113 million, if my, my math is correct, 118 million. Actually. And um, well, I think I might say one should be asking our brokers this question. The advice we had on the funding, uh, as you know, one can have a full rights issue. Uh, to, to allow people to exercise all their preemption rights, you'd have to have a full rights issue. And the advice from our brokers and, and looking at our share register, which has a preponderance of, uh, you know, very already had a preponderance of very, very strong institutions, uh, the view is taken that it's best interest really of the company and the process and the shareholders to uh, undertake what's, you know, a, 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 what's called a soft preemption to go and consult and to have a placing that did not. Um, you know, go out to all our shareholders, um, and that's part, you know, mainly because actually a very high portion of our shares are institutional, and therefore could be approached through a, through an institutional placing, uh, and and that's what the GM will, will approve. Uh, Dion, yes, your follow up to the capital markets day. It was a virtual one. Um, 
you know December 20 there. It must have been around about there. Yeah, I think it was November actually, but anyway. Um, would be good to have a real one soon. Um, yeah, noted. Uh, I think pr probably we should be considering that. It's not on the agenda right now, but um, it, it's definitely something for us to consider. Yeah. Um, Nick B asks about geographic regions to expand in. Um, at the moment, no, as, as I mentioned before, uh, not at this stage any further geographies to expand in. Uh, and Nick also asks, what's the, what does the pipeline of new products look like? Um, so, we, as I said, we brought seven to market last year, and I think we need a, a, a bit of time to uh, bed them in, both in terms of uh, getting our people up to speed with them, familiar with them, comfortable with them, and selling them in at a, a staged rate to the clients. We don't want to suddenly you know, appear with a whole range of, of products and services and confuse them. So we're just taking a little bit of a pause on that. Uh, we are working on, um, I think there's another four solutions that we're working on, um, and I think we will bring them to market, or at least, at least two of them, we'll bring at least two of them to market in the second half of this year. Uh, Dion S, why on what appears to be a strong rising recovery from 2020 was revenue in the second half of 21 less than in the first half? Um, it wasn't less, it was slower rate of growth. Yeah, correct. The revenue in the second half was, was higher than the first. It's just really that the first half of 2020 was, you know, particularly uh, low level. And therefore, um, you know, we, we, we had already, if you remember, we had recovered 2021, 2020 second half grew, I think, memory about 9% compared to 2020 first half. And therefore, it was already a higher base as we came to 21. So it's, it's a function of really the comparator that um, the second half of 20 had been stronger and therefore so second half of 21 grew, but not by as much as we'd grown over the first half, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think there's another question. Given the cash generated nature of the business, also recognizing you appear to have good organic investment opportunities, what is the management attitude dividend? I think I've already covered that, but I'll repeat that we don't have, you know, we obviously keep under review every, as we should as a board, our dividend policy. Um, having stopped the dividends two years ago, we don't have any immediate plans to restore it, but we will keep it under review. I obviously make the point that whilst we have our cash generative, um, we had been, um, you know, quite significant, uh, imposition of quite significant net debt. So our dividend payment capacity was to some extent limited by that, uh, and also cranky by an accounting issue, making sure we had sufficient reserves. But uh, we, we keep it under review, is, is all I can really say. Um, uh, I was going to say, sorry, that, that's the last question. So I'll, I'll pass back to you, uh, Alessandro. Nick, Alan, thank you very much. Thank you being, for being so generous with your time there. I think you actually managed to address every question from the investors. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the InvestMeet company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, Nick, I was just wondering if I could ask you for a few closing comments. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Alessandro. I mean, first of all, thank you very much for your time and for listening. Um, I think I just want to leave you with a, a view that management, I, myself and Alan, um, feel we've got the business into a, a good place now, very stable stable footing, stable foundations. Uh, we have a very clear and focused strategy. Um, we're executing on that. Um, we feel uh, very, very uh, pleased with the acquisitions that we've made, which will really uh, accelerate our strategy to transform the business. Um, and we will uh, First of all, make sure these businesses are integrated successfully, and then we will keep uh, keep reviewing opportunities to further inorganic growth. So thank you very much for listening. We, we, we think we're in a good place and to move forward. Nick, thank Alan, thank you for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session, as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few minutes to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Ubiquity PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session and good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon. Bye.